Hi everyone, today we are going to be talking about how to get level 10 in FaceIt in 2024. Me and my teammate and good friend McCade are going to first talk about who we are and why you might want to listen to some of the advice we have on how to get to level 10. I think it's good to first understand who you're getting advice from before you practice it. So we're going to talk a little bit about who we are and you know how long we've been playing the game and what our experience is. So uh, McCade and I have been playing for several years, I think some, something like five years at this point. Um, we made it to Intermediate Division in the ESCA League. My competitive FPS journey first started actually on console playing Overwatch back in 2017. I hit top 500 on PS4 and then eventually switched to PC to compete at a higher level. I recognized that the best players were on PC at the time. I was Grandmaster on PC pretty quickly after that. Um, eventually I decided to switch to playing CSGO back in 2019. Anybody who's familiar with Overwatch knows that the meta has changed um, very rapidly and, and that was something that I wasn't very happy with so CS provided a great alternative. I personally have over 7,000 hours now in CS uh, in 2024. I've been level 10 in CSGO and now in CS2 I also hit level 10. I currently have something like 4,500 matches on FaceIt. I'd be lying if I said to you that I maintain a level 10 rating all the time. I do play a lot, as you can tell from my hours. My peak in FaceIt is uh, 2350 as of 2024. So why listen to us? Um, what I would say is that we do have tons of experience when it comes to playing FaceIt and also tons of experience on the game. And we do have some ESCA team experience as well. But a disclaimer would be is that we aren't pros. We aren't even necessarily high rank, you know, level 10 face it players. Um, but hopefully these are tips that'll help you guys improve uh, faster than we did. And <laughs> you won't have to spend as many thousands of hours as I have on the game. I will say over the years, I've spent far too much money on, you know, CSGO guides and aiming guides. Hopefully this would be some good advice and a great refresher for anybody looking to improve. So with that being said, let's jump right into it. Um, I just want to firstly start off by talking about prosettings.com and uh, how that can improve your mechanics just right off the get-go. Um, so there is a CS2 guide that's on prosettings.com. For, um, for a lot of competitive games out there, there is a guide on pro settings. And why is this important? Well, it can save you a lot of time in terms of finding the best settings, that way you're hitting your shots and just gain the most responsive gunplay. As you can see, they, they show you a lot of the best settings, which is good, the best launch options, the best resolution. Um, for anyone curious, I do use 1920 by 1080, but largely CS is dominated by stretched res players at the moment, at least has been for the last decade or so. But I'd say just pick whatever resolution makes you the most comfortable. There is definitely an advantage by playing on stretched, I would say, um, but I've been playing on native for my full 7,000 hours. Something else that I think is important for you to think about is your eDPI. So um, eDPI is your sense times your DPI, and um, that's just basically how fast your sensitivity is in game, um, which is, I think is a, is something important you should consider. You know, I think operas tend to have a faster sensitivity than riflers. Riflers usually have a slower sensitivity. Thinking about sensitivity, though, the current um, medium EDPI for CS2 Pros is 830. So for example, my EDPI currently is um, 1.8 times 400, which is 720. So my sense is a little slower than most CS2 Pros. So the most common DPI right now is 400 DPI. And that's what it's been as long as I've been playing. It's definitely possible to get great using a really slow sense or a really high sense, but it'd be more of a niche um, setting for you to be using and harder to master. To reach the highest levels in CS2, I would say a 144 hertz monitor or above is at least required these days. I don't think it's impossible to hit level 10 on a 60 hertz monitor, but it would definitely be pretty hard. If you can get a desk that's at least um, 75 centimeters or below, that's also gonna be a large advantage for you. If you wanna go take it a step further than that, then an adjustable desk would be the best thing you could probably get. The key is to get as much room as possible for you to move your arm. The more room you have is going to 
give you the most control over your mouse, which will ultimately give you the best advantage in game. A pro tip I would give you is to cut off the armrest if you're comfortable doing so on your chair. That's just another way you can gain more leverage over your mouse. Next, I'd like to talk about warming up. Using aim trainers like Kovacs and Aim Labs uh, can be an extremely helpful way to improve your aim. I believe Kovacs and Aim Labs have a great place, but the best thing you could most likely use for practice would be workshop maps in CSGO or CS2. Um, workshop maps are in the game, and I think that's definitely an advantage. You want to be as comfortable as you can possibly be in the game. I have 300 hours combined on aim trainers, Kovacs and aim labs, but I would say my time spent on workshop maps doing y pracs and um, refrag scenarios has definitely been very well spent and probably built the most confidence for me. So just keep in mind that aim trainers do not replace the actual game. Um, they just help you build confidence. You should also play retakes and deathmatch. Retakes, deathmatch, aim trainers, they all have really, really great application for specific reasons, but I wouldn't overplay um, any specific version of these training scenarios. I would just focus on being as familiar as you can with all of them. Your goal is to be as comfortable when match time comes as possible, and the best way to be comfortable is just to practice often. Without further ado, let's kick the ball over to McCade, who can talk a little bit about what it takes to be great when it comes to game sense. Upstart and I have been playing Counter-Strike for a long time. We have over 6,000 games to face it and 12,000 hours between us in the game. And in our very first season of ESEA Open, we actually advanced to IM. I'm going to talk about game sense. This is, in my opinion, the most important skill you can have in this game besides just knowing like where to put your crosshair like on this angle for example uh, and it's probably the hardest skill to learn because it just takes so many raw hours of playing the game and analyzing understanding what people do how they react so it's mainly just going to be playing the game a lot is going to develop your game sense but i can give you some pointers uh, like if if you know crosshair placement and you can peek angles like this and you know where someone is going to be likely to peek you next, automatically you have an advantage in that gunfight. In every fight you take in this game, you're going to want to have an advantage. If you're taking a fight where you have a disadvantage, you're doing something wrong. Pretty of the information you'll need to use Game Sense correctly is going to be gathered either in previous rounds that you've played against this team, uh, or just in a default that you guys do, like on T side, for example. Maybe you have three people coming mid. You have like smoke window, smoke con, one guy watching the A main push and then one guy's like lurking in apps. This makes it so that every choke point on the map you can get intel from. Like this guy in apps, maybe he gets up here and he hears someone walking CAD, he can hear this guy like jump spotting van. That's two positions you know about. The mid people, they can see if people are flashing over A and then now we know there's a guy tripling. That'll sort of inform you on how they're likely to play in their default in the future and you can try to find the gap that way. You know, find out what your opponents like to do think of ways to counter them and yeah just go from there yeah so you're going to want to be calming everything especially if you're the lurker the best thing you can do for your team is give information it is so helpful just to know where people are going to be playing because like i said it's going to help your teammates game sense uh in that they're going to be ready for things that are likely to happen like for example on a mid default with smokes down flashes over we have mid control what does the enemy team do do they walk push a main do they throw flashes over and try to retake mid? Do they have, you know, a double up cat? Like, what's their reaction when something starts to work? That'll sort of give you insight on, like, how the, this particular enemy team thinks about the game, and you can sort of predict what they're likely to do, even if they haven't done it yet. And also, reading your minimap is very important, especially if you're the lurker. Having even a vague idea of where your team is posturing towards or when they're about to make contact is very important, uh, especially on something like a crunch, where the timing needs to be pretty tight then yeah, especially as a lurker, it's going to give you more insight on when it's safe for you to come out. Like if your team just made contact A and you hear the guy stepping B, like he's rotating off, maybe you can get a timing on him to kill him on the rotate and then you take B site. Um, or you just get that timing and you slowly take the site and you, you know, creep up into their spawn while your team is like still pressuring. You have options. The more info you have, the more options there are. And yeah, don't be afraid to ask your teammates for info. Like, if, if you've had a guy in B-Apps or you've had a guy in Palace for most of the default rounds, they're going to know something 
about how the A guy plays or how the B guy plays, or you know what they do every round, what kind of nades they throw at the start, and they're going to be able to relay, relay that information so that you guys can make a plan for a better execute or a counterplay or something like that. Information is the strongest weapon in this game, and it's not close. Next thing I want to cover just quickly is solo queuing versus stacking. Both have their merits. I have my preference. Uh, solo queue, it can be approached a lot of different ways, but if you want the best chance of winning, you're going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, it doesn't always mean being like the IGL, calling for everyone. Some people have gotten comfortable in certain areas of the map, and most of the time it is better to let them do what they do best and try to work off of them instead. But the most important thing in solo queue, I'd say, is just to not tilt. It's hard, I know, it's incredibly easy to tilt in solo queue and increases the chances of you losing that game by a ton. But if you can stay focused, play your game, be nice to your teammates, try your best, keep everything friendly, stay positive, you'll just have a better time, even if you don't win, you know, at least you're playing the game. And uh, just quickly to touch on a mindset type deal, if you're playing to win, you're not going to be improving as much as you would be if you were playing to improve, right? A loss is only a loss if you don't learn anything from it. If you don't know why you lost, then that's a real that's a real downer, you know? But if you lose and you're like, oh, I could have done this better. Oh, we lost because of this. You know, we weren't doing this enough. Now you have information that will help you win in the future. So growth mindset, very important. And then, yeah, Upstart can tell you more about his, his solo queue secrets. So let's talk about solo queue and how you can solo queue your way up to level 10. Admittedly, most times that I've hit level 10 or got level 10, it's actually been solo queuing. So to win solo queuing, you do need to fill for your team. Um, you're not going to be able to rely on your team to necessarily play certain spots. You need to play wherever your team needs you. That's going to be the most important thing. You might have a team that um, struggles to run in first. You might be entering. If you have a team that's great at running in together and they just aren't good at like covering flanks and looking for opportunities that way, then maybe you're going to be lurking. So you need to be a jack of all trades if you're going to be solo queuing. That's particularly why solo queuing can be kind of hard, um, but I recommend it. I think you will learn a lot if you do solo queue. Now let's talk about how or why you might want to play with a stack. Stacks, I think they're the easiest way to get out of ELO hell if that's where you find yourself, if you just find a good stack that you vibe with. Because the best part about them is that if you play with the same people of similar skill levels regularly, you all start to build up some rapport and you can get better at everything. It's going to help so much just to familiar, familiarize yourself with the people you're playing with the most and like how they like to approach the game, how your styles mesh together. And then it's also going to teach you a lot about the other roles in the game because you'll have you know teammates that you can speak with outside of the game. And you can ask them questions about like, you know, what's your go-to lurk play? What do you do when we do an A default? Like what's, how do you see the game? You know, it's going to give you a lot more insight feel a lot more comfortable around. Also, if you have an IGL, if you're playing in League, ask them questions. They will thank you for it. Ask them what you want them to do on this play. What should we do on this play? What kind of grenades should I throw? You know, just anything. Ask them anything and they'll, I'm sure they'll help you out. And then yeah, another thing that playing with a stack is going to help out with is helping you pick which role you want to play. Uh, whether it be support, opera, IGL, lurker, you know, you can try them all and then pick whichever one makes the most sense to you as a player, whichever one, uh, you know, complements your style the most, and then just try to master that one. You know, same thing with like picking an area of the map. If you're actually on an ESEA team, you've been assigned an area like on CT, master that one area. Uh, in contrast though, if you're the IGL, you should be mastering the macro of the game, like positioning, team play, and sort of have a basic understanding of all the individual positions. Uh, so it's, you're going to be focusing on different areas depending on your role, basically. Yeah, every stag is going to be very different from the from the rest. You know, it's it's probably going to take a couple tries for you to find one that you like, one that likes you. Uh, it's important that the different play styles can mesh in a way that makes sense, so no one feels out of place. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done if you put in the effort, having consistent mental. So. First thing, don't be too hard on yourself, right? This is a hard game. It takes a lot of time, uh, not only to get good mechanically, but to keep your cool when shit gets tough. Um, so yeah, just focus on trying your best every round. Really try and analyze why you died or lost the round, or if you didn't die or lose, 
If you won, you can think of something that you could have done better, a mistake that you made anyway, a mistake that was made by the enemy that you exploited, you know, have this analytical brain sort of just running at full speed the whole time. Another very, very important point about mentality is to have confidence. It doesn't matter how bad of a player you are, not having confidence is only going to hurt you in this game. If you think you're going to lose, you're right. If you think you're going to win, you might be right. You know, it's, it's very much a mentality-based game where you kind of have to believe what you want to happen is going to happen and just roll with the punches. Use your real life brain for this kind of stuff. You know, this isn't Call of Duty. You can actually think about like logically what your team should be doing, what the enemy team is likely to do. Obviously this works better in high level phase or ESEA than just like, you know, solo queue premiere or some shit, but it is going to help out if you actually think about the play that you're going to do before you do it instead of just running down mid mindlessly peeking this window guy and dying every round. If you thought about it, it doesn't sound like a good idea, but people still do it. Don't do that. If you're looking for a group, if you're looking for a stack, there's plenty of places online you can look. Faceit has a Discord, Mythic League has a Discord, you can just join Mythic League as well on Faceit. I think for the lower ranks it's free. Uh, there's this website called teams.d teams.gg you can sign up to people hook up on there all the time there's a prac.com discord a refrag.gg discord uh, you can find people to play with on all of those there's probably an ESEA discord too I haven't even looked but uh, yeah that's about it another way that we can help to build confidence is watching the game whether it's watching your favorite streamer watching competitive matches watching your own vods to look for mistakes and how you can improve you need to watch the game and be familiar with it something that's helped me a lot is finding a player that i really like their play style and feel like matches my own and i emulate their play style and i, I look at what they do well and i take those and i add it to my own play and things that they don't do well is something you wouldn't add of course try to take the best out of players that you um think are match your play style you don't have to reinvent the wheel and develop a play style that's game changing you could just take off of something that's that works when it comes to matchmaking don't be afraid to queue if you play a lot and are always focused on improvement your rank will improve it's just a matter of time it's impossible to be unlucky forever and every single game can't be unlucky if you are stuck in a low rank take ownership of why you are there you're in that rank for a reason so don't blame your teammates every time you lose. That's just a terrible mentality and it's not gonna help you get better. A way that I like to think of it too is, if, for example, if Twist was in level one face it, if he was in my rating and I was that rank, would he still be losing that game? No, he wouldn't because he's Twist. He would find a way to win. That's what you need to do, find a way to win. I highly recommend looking for like-minded players, whether it's on Discord, face it, Steam, you can find players that are even better than you. That's a great thing. All right, thank you for watching. Do you like this content? What else do you wanna see? Any other tips for improving? Please leave us a comment. As a reminder, I stream seven to 10 Eastern time every weekday on Twitch. So please check me out there, give me a follow. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. A huge thank you to McCade for assisting with this video and giving some great ideas. Please follow his channel. It's all linked down below. Thanks for watching. Ooh, that ace was fucking nuts, bro.